So, so this, is, this talk is going to be, b the basic theme is to understand, to try and understand something about the geometry. Sorry, no, Hi, Ian. <laughs> I, I was hoping to get this part in before you came. But uh, <laughs> the, the basic idea is to understand the geometry of hyperbolic three manifolds that fiber over the circle. So these are or something about these three-dimensional surfaces that are made by taking a surface cross I and gluing together the two boundary surfaces. So this, this is one of the classes that Thurston studied. And he showed that when this gluing map is uh, pseudo-Anisov, then this three-manifold admits a hyperbolic structure. And it wasn't clear at the time how special or general these are. So it turned out later, due to this recent theorem of Ian Agold, that, that Every, th every hyperbolic manifold is finitely covered by one of these. Every closed hyperbolic three manifold has a finite cover of this type. So if we want to understand uh, the geometry of hyperbolic three manifolds, namely what they look like, some of their geometric properties, this, this is uh, a reasonably general class. Certainly, we need to understand the geometry of these things. And what kind of questions might we ask about the geometry? What, a, what I mean? Well, so here's here's a question that's unknown. Uh, so let's say that the fiber has genus G. What is the smallest area that a fiber of genus G can have? So it turns out that if you that you can take these fibers to be as small as you like, there's the smallest possible area. We know that this area is always, this area of a fiber of genus G is always a bigger or equal to 2G minus 2. Uh, we don't know how close you can get to 2G minus 2. We know we can always make a fiber smaller or equal to 4G minus 4. So somewhere between 2G minus 2 and 4G minus 4 is the smallest possible area that you can make a fiber. But times pi, uh, right. Uh, yeah, so the lower bound, let me say, is, uh, is, uh, comes from you take a, a, a least possible surface, you can find the least area surface, and then you have some additional information because it's stable. It's, you can do a, you can look at the area of a perturbation. And as far, I think that this was originally, this was explained to me many years ago by Karen Ollenbeck. And I think it's due to a combination of her and Shane Yao. Uh, it's not explicitly written as far as I know in their papers. I, I put it in a paper I, I wrote, but it's certainly not due to me. So uh, maybe you can say something about the history if, later. Anyway, uh, the uh, the upper bound uh, is is also also the fact that there is a that you can make some f the fi you, that you can make a fiber have area less than this just just comes because uh, it's essentially the uh, the Gauss Bonnet theorem. Uh, you take a minimal fiber, smallest fiber. And then it's more negative than the ambient space. Its intrinsic curvature is more negative than the ambient space because it's got mean curvature zero. And uh, so the worst possible, the biggest possible hyperbolic surface of genus G 
in a hyperbolic map, uh, the, the biggest possible surface of minimal surface of genus G in a hyperbolic three manifold would have this area. That would be a totally geodesic surface. That would be the so so somehow the totally geodesic case is the largest possible area for a minimal surface. And the more it curves, the smallest its area. So this is saying there's some some sort of glo global bound on how much curvature you can get. So the upper bound is strict too. The upper bound is strict for a fiber. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Be uh, well. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to try and improve these two bounds for, for bundles. Actually, you could ask the same question for arbitrary. If you took an arbitrary closed hyperbolic three manifold, we know now that they always have pi one injective surfaces. So you could ask, what's the smallest area of a surface inside any hyperbolic three manifold? That's from Kahn Markowitz. We know that they always have some surface. The area for the smallest surface would be some number bigger than this. Uh, with g equals 2. And so that's some topological invariant of hyperbolic 3 manifolds that, uh, that we don't have much idea. How no. Take, you can take any surface. Yeah, you can. That so I'm, I'm saying inject. Right, I'm just going to talk about the five of the manifolds, but but you could ask the question about the lower bound for any. What the what the area of the smallest essential surface in a three manifold is? That's a topological invariant of the three manifold, which we we don't have much idea how to calculate usually. Uh, So you could ask, what's the smallest surface that appears in any hyperbolic three manifold? Is some global ba lower bound? Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do today is to show you that uh, to answer another question, which is when you have one of these manifolds. Is it possible to make each of the fibers? Min a minimal surface. So this problem comes up from, I think it was also originally asked by Uhlenbeck. Okay. It appears in one of your papers, I think, somewhere. Uh, uh, yeah, mo a lot of these hyperbolic geometry questions really go, go back to Thurston. And there's several reasons this come up. It comes up. It comes up in, in studies. I think uh, the motivation at the time was something to do with the limits of quasi Fuchsian groups and how they, how they behaved. Uh, how their geometric limits existed, but uh, behave. But but there's another uh, there's another motivation which is which is more analytic. Namely, you can ask uh, you can ask: Is a minimal surface in a hyperbolic three manifold always isolated? So is it possible to have some minimal surface which is a limit of other minimal surfaces? So somehow, uh, can f be a limit as i goes to infinity of some sequence of minimal surfaces? And uh, if this was the case, then the, there would actually, it turns out that because everything is analytic, this these minimal surfaces solve analytic PDEs, and the hyperbolic metric is analytic. There would actually be a family of minimal surfaces, 
through this surface F. And uh, you can keep extending the you could keep extending this family outwards, and then one of two things would happen. Either you'd have a minimal vibration if it's a compact surface, compact three manifold, or you'd uh, limit to uh, to a neighborhood of of a non-orientable surface. So you could have two, you could have a union of two I bundles, or you could have a bundle over the circle. If you had a union of two I bundles, it would be covered, double covered by a minimal vibration. So these two questions are, are closely related also. There's some other motivations for this problem as well. Um, it uh, gives an approach to try and understand whether negatively curved three manifolds remain negatively curved under Ricci flow. Anyway, what I'm going to prove today is that uh, the, a partial answer to this uh, so the theorem is that uh, there are examples of minimal vibrations that cannot be, uh, there are examples of three manifolds that fiber over the circle that cannot be fibered with minimal surfaces. So I, actually, uh, I have some notes of the, this, this result came out of a conversation I had with Bill Thurston in 1984. I have my notes still, uh, which, which I never wrote up. Uh, but uh, I did write it up last year. It's on the archive. And it, around the same time, uh, a similar argument was given by Wang and Wang. They, they actually did a much more explicit geometric computation than I'm doing. <coughs> but uh, the idea is somewhat similar. So I'll try and show you what that construction is. Let me say a little bit more about, uh, about this problem, though. First of all, it's, there's no there's no local reason why this should be true. Why you, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to to fiber. In fact, you you can do something like this. You can take hyperbolic three space and take a curve that's uh, close to the equator, and that will span a least area a least area plane. And now you can translate this using isometries, you can translate this up and down. And you'll get a foliation of hyperbolic three space by minimal planes. So there's no local obstruction to having minimal foliations in hyperbolic manifolds. It's not hard to show that this, this construction does give you a foliation. So the reason that one would think the, way, the reason why these don't exist, if they don't, is going to have to do with the topology of, the, of, the, of a compact manifold or of a finite volume manifold. There's no local reason why they can't exist. Another interesting thing about these three manifolds is that there's a result of Sullivan and a Sullivan that sh says there is a, a metric, there is a smooth Riemannian metric in which each of the fibers is minimal. Uh, maybe, yeah. Well, we don't know, but but yeah, for this example, that's true. So 
So there's a, there's a Riemannian metric in which each leaf is met. There's some Riemannian metric. And this says that you can't always choose this to be the hyperbolic uh, metric. And in fact, in Sullivan's construction, one of the things that, that comes out of this is that if there is a minimal vibration, then each leaf is actually uh, not just not just minimal, meaning mean curvature zero. So minimal means that uh, locally, it in some neighborhood of a point, the uh, the surface minimizes area. But if you have a minimal f vibration, then each leaf is uh, actually area minimizing. It it minimizes area not just in neighborhoods of points, but in a very strong sense. And it minimizes area in its uh, homotopy class and even in its homology class. So there's no homologous surface of smaller area. So if you have a minimal vibration, you have this very strong minimization problem. Let me, let me ask a more general question, which is still unknown. Is, there, is it possible to have a minimal foliation of a hyperbolic three manifold? So is it possible to have a foliation in which every leaf is minimal? And I, my guess would be no, but uh, that's uh, certainly not known. OK, so l let me give you this construction, which shows how to construct a hyperbolic three-manifolded fibers over the circle that does not have a minimal vibration. And it turns out that the obstruction to having a minimal vibration, the thing that interferes with it, is some geometric property of this three manifold. And what we'll do is we'll construct such a manifold which has a short, a very short geodesic that's null homologous. So that bounds some surface, if you like. OK, so some of you will immediately know how to construct hyperbolic three manifolds with this property, that fiber. But let me d briefly describe an explicit way to construct this. So what we want to do is we want to const let me draw a picture of what this three manifold is. In general, we can think of a hyperbolic three manifolded fibers over the circle as looking something like this. It's got a circle's worth of surfaces. And uh, what we want to do is take uh, one of the curves in a in a fiber and make it very short. So we'd like to construct such a, such a three-manifold where one of these, where a separating curve on the fiber becomes very, very short. So geometrically, such a thing will look something like this. So you have these fibers. And one of these fibers is going to have a very short geodesic on it, which is out here. Right, we're going to construct a family where this geodesic gamma k has length going to 0.
So this surface will uh, will have its central curve pulled way out, far away geometrically from the rest of the manifold, out towards some cusp-like some cusp-like uh, region. And to explicitly construct such a thing, what we'll do is we'll use a theorem of, of Penner on how to construct pseudo-Anisov maps. So remember that you get this hyperbolic manifold at fibers over the circle whenever you glue together a surface cross I with a pseudo-Anisov map. Penner tells us that if you take a surface, and on it you take two collections of curves. Let's take, uh, say, this collection. And this collection. That should work. Uh, no, that won't work. If we take these two collections of curves, in fact, the conditions you need are that C union D fill the surface. So the complement of C union D is just a bunch of disks. If you take two such things and then you do Dane twists in the positive direction around the first collection, and negatively along D, and that will give you a pseudo anisov map. So we can, for example, take a one Dane twist in the positive direction along each of these three curves, and one Dane twist in the negative direction along each of these three curves, except for the curve C1, I'm going to take uh, k twists along C1. And we'll use that to glue this surface to itself in constructing this uh, three manifold. Call that map F sub k. Then the manifold M sub k that you get that will fiber over the circle. It will have pseudo anisov gluing, so it will be hyperbolic, and it'll have a very, very short curve. This, uh, this curve that corresponds to C1 will get shorter and shorter as you iterate this pseudo anisov uh, twisting map. In fact, uh, the geometry of this bundle that you get is described by Thurston's Dane surgery theor theorem. Because uh, using, this, using these uh, more and more Dane twists is equivalent to doing a surgery, uh, to doing sur Dane surgery along this curve corresponding to C1 in the fiber. And Thurston's Dane surgery theorem says that uh, says that the manifold MK that you get by this process. that these manifolds geometrically converge to some manifold M. And this manifold, well, so the picture is something like uh, these manifolds have increasingly short curves, gamma k. And this limiting manifold has a cusp. It has a, it's a non-compact manifold which has a torus cusp. Could you only interrange the, the, the pseudodose of maps chosen so there's a unique vibration? Or no, I don't have to. Manifold, so you're no. Really all I'm ruling out all possible vibrations, yeah. So that's just because it's not just this one fiber that appears to 
No, it's going to be any fiber. And the, the reason is that, that this curve is null homologous. And a null homologous curve is always homotopic onto a fiber in any fibration. Uh, so it doesn't matter which fibration you take for this construction. Although you could pick one with a unique fibration if you like, but you don't have to. So, so now that now we've got these uh, these manifolds that look increasingly, as k goes to infinity, like a manifold with a cusp. We've got these manifolds that fiber that have increasingly short geodesics. They limit to this manifold with a cusp geometrically. And uh, why, why is it that the claim is that once k is sufficiently large, these manifolds don't have minimal vibrations? So the idea is uh, quite simple as to why that's true. If this did have a minimal vibration, then you'd have some way of filling up this manifold with minimal fibers. Then these, these minimal surfaces, homot homotopic to a fiber, would go arbitrarily far into a cusp. This distance is actually going to infinity. The distance from the, the neighborhood of a very short curve has a, is a solid torus, and the tubular neighborhood radius goes to infinity as the length of the curve goes to zero. So these minimal surfaces would go way, way out into here. And to understand the geometry of what's happening, it's convenient to think about, think about things in this uh, cusp limit uh, manifold. Lengths and areas are converging nicely as you take these geometric limits. So we, we're not really penalized if we think about what's happening in the cusp instead of in the, in the neighborhood of the geodesic. So let's think in a cusp. Uh, so what does a cusp of a hyperbolic 3 manifold look like? Well, it's a torus. And we can think of it as, in the upper half space model, as being some quadrilateral, uh, the z direction in the upper half space model of hyperbolic space. So each one of these tori corresponds to some har har torus which goes out towards the cusp. So they're getting smaller as, as you go up. And we can call these har tori, let's call them T sub s, where s goes off to infinity. And so the, there's some choice about how we choose these parameters for these tori. So what we'll do is we'll pick uh, T sub s to be the torus in the cusp whose shortest essential curve has length s, has uh, length 1 over s. So this is a good way to parameterize the tori in a natural geometric way. So then s turns out to be 1 over 2 times the injectivity radius of the torus Ts. So as we go up, these tori are getting smaller. And s, just uh, the index, ind indicates what their injectivity radius are, is. So the basic idea about what makes this, this uh, estimate, 
this estimate work, this, uh, what makes these minimizers not uh, feasible inside these neighbors of short geodesics is that as s goes to infinity, so as you move up, what happens to the area of T sub s? Well, in the one of the nice things about uh, the upper half space model is s exactly corresponds to the height in the upper half space model. So as s goes to infinity, the area of T sub s goes to zero, approximately like one over s squared, proportionally to one over s squared. Both lengths go down linearly as you go up in the in the upper half space model. So the injectivity radius is going down linearly, but areas go down like s squared. And uh, what, a, what about the area of this, uh, of this fiber? If you had some fiber that goes way up and comes down again, well, we can do a little estimate to see that if this, goes, if this is a minimal surface and it goes way, way up in the in this cusp, it, go, it goes as far up as we like, then as s goes to infinity, the area of this, uh, of this surface intersects, say, the region between s and 2s, the part of the cusp between s and 2s, this goes down like uh, 1 over s. It goes down more slowly, and I'll show you why that is in, in a minute. But once you see that the area of these tori is, is getting small faster than the area of this minimal surface is getting small, then you can just say, well, let's go out far enough in this cusp. And now let's look on this torus. The part of the fiber that goes from this torus to the torus corresponding to twice the parameter from Ts to T2s, this part, this part of the fiber has more area once s is big, then the area of this torus, uh, which is the boundary of this cusp. And now we can say, well, but this was supposed to be an area minimizing surface. So let's take, a, let's take some region on this torus that this surface bounds. Why does it bound the surface? Because this whole surface can be pushed off the cusp. It misses the, it goes far out into the cusp, but it doesn't intersect the shortest curve. So we can push that fiber off of the cusp. So it bounds some subsurface of the torus. But the area of the torus is less than the area of this fiber in s above the torus. That contradicts the area minimizing property. It's supposed to be a smallest possible surface. So, it's a, so the, the fact that the area of these tori is shrinking like 1 over s squared is straightforward from this picture. The hyperbolic metric is uh, 1 over z times the Euclidean metric. So areas sh shrink quadratically as you go up. But what about the, what, how can we get, how can we see that the, the area of the, of the surface is, is not shrinking faster than 1 over s? Well, there's various ways to do this. But the simplest way is to use what's known as a monotonicity estimate. So let's look at the region in this cusp that's between s and 2s. And supposing that this, this minimal fiber goes all the way from s up to 2s, then we can prove the following lemma. If, 
if the torus that we look at has index s bigger than 8 times the area of t1, and f is a smooth, compact, area-minimizing surface, with boundary f contained in this torus Ts, and boundary f separating in Ts, then f doesn't go up as high as the torus with, with uh, index 2s. Okay, so that says that uh, an area minimizing torus which intersects this torus Ts does not reach as high as T2s. So once uh, once this geodesic is short enough, we can no longer get up to it with fi minimal fibers. And how do you how do you prove something like this? Well, what you need is a lower bound on the area of such a minimal surface. And the standard way to get lower bounds on minimal surfaces is to use something called a monotonicity estimate. So a monotonicity estimate, which holds in hyperbolic space, says that if you have a minimal surface that goes through the center of a ball of radius r, so maybe the minimal surface looks something like this. Might be some saddle type surface, and it, it comes through the center of the ball, then uh, then its area is bigger or equal to the area of a disk, a flat disk of area r, of uh, radius r, rather, which is uh, 2 pi times, let's see, cos r minus 1. in hyperbolic space. So in particular, it's not possible to have a minimal surface that comes through the center of a ball in, a, in some kind of a tube like this without, that doesn't have very much area. You can't get area less than the totally geodesic disk that goes through the center of a ball. And this is not hard to prove. Uh, it's been known for at least 40 years for hyperbolic space. Anyway, uh, what does that have to do with this? Well, what you do is you apply this result on this, uh, on these family of tori, and you see that between s and s plus 1, you can stick a ball in here, and the minimal surface, if you position that ball correctly, must, will pass through the center of that ball, and in fact, you can do it. You can find another ball, maybe positioned a little differently, between s plus 1 and s plus 2. And you keep on doing that all the way up to 2s. So you get s balls of decreasing radius. And you estimate the area that the minimal surface must have passing through each one. You need to get some lower bound on the size of these tori. but that comes by comparing it to T1. The, it turns out that the, the area of uh, the torus at, at height, uh, the torus with injectivity radius 1, can be bounded below. And you know that these are just 1 over s squared times that, that area. 
So, so you can you can apply monotonicity, and that implies that the, in fact, that the area between S and two S, is. Uh, Well, it's greater or equal to 1 over, well, the, yeah, so it, it turns out to be greater or equal to 1 over 16s. And under the conditions that I wrote down here, this turns out to be too big to allow a minimizing surface when s is bigger or equal to 8 times the area of t1. So that's how, that's how you can uh, rule out the existence of uh, minimal vibrations when you have very short uh, curves in these fibers. Uh, so. So one, one thing that you might wonder is, is uh, right. So, what since since there is a there is a minimal vibration and the, and there is some there is a there it is possible to get all the fibers. To have uh, to have small area as as you go around, it, I'm not I'm not claiming that the area of the fibers gets unbounded as you as you go around this uh, circle. So even a short a short geodesic does not mean that the area of uh, the surface going through that short geodesic goes to infinity. All it means is that it's not very efficient at. Uh, at going into and out of the neighborhood of the of the geodesic without crossing the geodesic, that, that's what's uh, really being claimed here. <coughs> okay. So, as a final remark, uh, let me just say that you can actually prove something stronger than this. So given, a, given some surface F, you can let uh, IF denote the smallest possible area of any surface with the same boundary as F. Okay, so then the standard definition of area minimizing is that uh, we say that uh, that f is area minimizing if the area of x is smaller or equal to the infinimum of possible areas for all subsets, all compact subsurfaces, say. So that's what it means to be area minimizing, even if a surface is not compact. It means that uh, it's got smallest possible area on all its compact subsurfaces. And uh, when we look at these competing subsurfaces, we can restrict them to a homotopy class or homology class. So for our purposes, let's Let's assume that uh, that 
uh, x is homologous to the competitors. So we'll stay in the same homolog homology class. Anyway, uh, if you look at this, uh, this argument a little bit harder, you can, you can see that it extends from minimal surfaces to, to a larger class of, sur of surfaces. We can say that f is 1, 2, quasi-area minimizing. If it satisfies two things, two properties, the first is that its mean curvature is small or equal to 1 everywhere. So a minimal surface would have mean curvature 0. But we can relax that to allow a mean curvature up to 1. And uh, the second condition is that if x is a surface of, of f, then the area of x is not doesn't have to minimize. It just has to be less than twice the minimum. among all, homology, all homologous surfaces. So this is much weaker than being a, a least area or area minimizing surface. You only require that you be minimizing up to a factor of 2, and you require that the mean curvature be at most 1 rather than 0. And it turns out that you can show that there's no fibrations by a hyperbolic 3 manifolds for these examples by one, two quasi-area minimizing surfaces. So these manifolds don't even have approximately minimal vibrations. with that, I think.